Okay. I did it. I figured it out, I think. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Radical History. Uh, I apologize for my extended absence, but I'm very excited to be back. Very excited to be talking about history, and I'm especially very excited to be talking about pirates. Those of you who don't know me in person might not know this, but I wrote my, well, I studied pirates in both undergraduate and graduate school, and I wrote some extensive, well, a lot of, I wrote a lot about them. And it's, I guess, funny that I haven't talked about them yet on Radical History. I have talked about it or talked about pirates and pirate related issues and some of my other in-person talks, but this is a area of extreme interest to me and I'm looking forward to talking about it. I'm really looking forward to talking about it and I will probably do another talk, maybe several sometime soon on pirates as a whole, but today I specifically want to talk about, well, I want to talk about queer pirates, essentially, for lack of a better term, or the popular perception of pirates and how they fit into queer history and the history of transgressive or otherwise gender or sexually nonconforming people. Uh, talking about this is a little tricky for reasons that I'm going to explain in just a moment. I'll come back to that. But basically, I'm going to be talking about pirates and pirate fiction, popular perception of piracy, and how that relates to the history of homoerotic, uh, otherwise, again, sexually or gender nonconforming behavior. And... The occasion for this, well, there's, you know, this is something that I actually wrote about extensively and have studied in great detail. But the specific reason that I want to talk about this right now, or the excuse that I'm using essentially is, as you'll see up here in the corner, Our Flag Means Death, which is a very funny show starring Reese Darby and uh, Tadawaiki. Uh, about Steed Bonnet and Blackbeard and a number of other pirates. And it is, I'm not going, well, actually, so before I continue, I'm not going to talk in great detail about this show or any other show, but just be aware that there may be mild spoilers for Our Flag Means Death, for Black Sails, the star show, for, for Captain Singleton, written by Daniel Defoe in 1720, so I, I suppose if you were still hoping to get to that one, uh, skip this lecture for now. I, again, this isn't really about any of those shows but I, I or about those pieces of media, but given that they were the jumping off point, I want to talk about them and I want to talk about what makes them so interesting to me. So, without out of the way... Basically, the, the point, the thing that I was sort of avoiding and I want to give you a heads up about is that Our Flag Means Death is is pretty queer. Uh, it's pretty good about queer representation, as my understanding is, based on my friends who are far more queer than I am and enjoy it very much. There are on-screen um, homosexual relationships. There are non, There's a non-binary character. There are all sorts of... Um, again, what we might describe as transgressive uh, for the time period, uh, queer representation in a way that, uh, again, I find very uh, charming and healthy and wholesome and everyone that I've talked to seems to like. What I'm not going to do, by the way, is delve too deeply into this show itself because of two things. One, it's not historical, which is okay. In fact, that's A+. Plus. I love that they've used Steve Bonnet and Blackbeard's historical relationship as a jumping off point. It's very funny to me as a historian of the time period. Uh, and I think that it, it makes no qualms or promises about being historical and it does not bother me even remotely that it's not historical. So 
that's part of why I won't talk about it. And two, I don't really want to get involved in any fandom shit. So uh, I am steering clear of that. It's a funny show. I like it. If you have things to say about the show itself, by all means, express them. I will ignore them. Um, it's funny, though. You should watch it. Um, and what's so fascinating about this show to me, again, the specific content of our flag means death aside is that it fits into a really fascinating tradition of writing about and depicting pirates as being in one way or another, uh, we'll say deviant, transgressive, um, liberated, etc. depending on your point of view. And that makes it very, very interesting to me. I, I have no idea whether or not the writers of the show were familiar with the, transi- the the tradition of this or the writing on this topic, but even if they weren't, uh, well, especially if they weren't, I think it actually fits very well with the sort of way that we remember and perceive pirates. So just be aware that this talk is going to delve into some potentially spicy, possibly uncomfortable topics, and that it's not actually going to be about either modern television shows or historical pirates all that much. It is about how pirates are and were perceived and about how their uh, behavior and how their circumstances allowed them to be or permitted others to sort of transpose ideas about sexuality and about um, normative behavior or non-normative behavior onto them and what's really, really interesting about that. Um, Part of why this is so challenging to talk about, and I, I just, I want to be clear here, is because of terminology. The Terms gay, lesbian, homosexual, uh, leaving aside terms like uh, transgender or non-binary, uh, were not known to or used by anybody in this time period positively or negatively. And even people who might today identify in one or more of those categories would not have in this time period. And so that makes it a little challenging sometimes to talk about. And, but I also think that's what makes it interesting. And I'm going to talk a bit about our modern obsession with categorizing and labeling later on, but just know that you could have a person who was very explicitly uh, gay, lesbian, uh, and, they would never have referred to themselves that way. They never would have even maybe even thought of themselves in such a way. There is also going to be, just because of the source material, a substantial reference to terms like sodomy and buggery. These are were legal terms in England at the time and are included in how contemporary writers spoke about the uh, about homosexual acts I will be referring to whenever possible relationships as or same sex relationships as homoerotic because I think this accurately depicts the relationship without applying any sort of labels to it so uh, hopefully that's not too unpleasant for everybody but I, I definitely want to give a heads up about this And be transparent about, you know, everything that's uh, going to transpire. So, without further ado, let's talk a little bit about the time period in question. So, let's... (coughs) Excuse me. Let's lay out some... uh, Some foundations, I suppose, for what we're talking about here. So sodomy, homosexual relationships, uh, other, any form of of non-normative sexual behavior is, I think, our perception as moderns, especially modern Americans, is that this has always been prohibited and has 
always been something that was strongly and sharply condemned by the authorities, especially by the church. That is not the case. Now, uh, you see here the um, destruction of, of Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible. It is, of course, prohibited uh, in one form or another in the Bible. I'm not going to go into too much detail about that. But this does not mean that homosexuality in any of its forms was prosecuted in any meaningful way. It's not until the 13th century in England that there is any sort of law on the books about homosexuality or homosexual acts. The, this is the Flata, uh, say commentarius. Uh, it's a just it's a unbelievably tedious legal tract uh, that was written in the late 13th century. Uh, it is the first mention of any sort of punishment for uh, homosexuality. The Flata indicates that sodomites should be buried alive. I want to be very clear that as far as I can tell, this punishment was never visited upon anybody for uh, for sodomy. Um, and up until the 16th century, homosexuality was like a lot of crimes, the exclusive domain of ecclesiastical courts who did not generally persecute these sorts of things. There is no indication that any sentences were pronounced for sodomy until uh, about basically the, the Tudor period. It wasn't until 1533, during the reign of Henry VIII, that buggery, again, was made a civil crime. It was, uh, again, previously limited to ecclesiastical censure, but this law and future laws like it, there was another Elizabethan law passed in the um, 1560s, uh, was more about a result, it was more about the struggle for power between the church and an expanding secular authority than really anything to do with restricting sexual activity or punishing uh, deviant behavior. And the reason why we know this or why this is strongly suspected is because at the time, homosexuality in one or more of its forms was pretty well known and tolerated in upper class English society as it was all over Europe. The late Elizabethan poet Richard Barnfield wrote a series of poems called The Affectionate Shepherd, which was... Uh, explicitly homoerotic uh, and was most likely about a possible relationship with William Stanley, the sixth Earl of Derby. Barnfield was forced to clarify that there it was not intentionally homoerotic, but there really isn't any, really isn't any doubt in his uh, writing or in that of his contemporaries. Uh, interestingly, Barnfield may have been the, um, rival poet mentioned in some of Shakespeare's sonnets. More notably, James I was uh, notoriously involved with George Villiers uh, and homosexual relations, especially, well, especially sodomy, was popular among the aristocrats of James's court. In this time period, and especially in this social context, these men often slept with women as well, and they were largely sleeping with, or they were having sex with, uh, younger men of lower social status. And this was understood, in both cases, not just to be masculine, but ultra-masculine, a, a sign of uh, excellent virility, that it was not um, in any way feminized or were seen as feminine, and the association of femininity with homosexuality is something that we would, would not emerge until much later. Uh, furthermore, another, none other than Lord Verulam, the Right Honorable Viscount St. Alban, Lord Chancellor Francis Bacon, uh, was very well known to prefer men. Uh, one MP wrote that he loved Welsh Sherm Welf uh, excuse me, Welsh serving men. Uh, especially one named Godric, who was described as a very effeminate-faced youth who the MP calls his catamite and bedfellow. Um, Francis Bacon was uh, 
or there were attempts to criticize or attack him for his uh, sexual predilections, but um, these were purely politically motivated. These were not really about the acts themselves. They were just opportunistic attacks on anything that they thought that they could pin him with. So during this time period, sodomy is prosecuted sometimes, but extremely rarely, up up through essentially the beginning of the 19th century. And when it is prosecuted, it is in contact with other crimes, sexual, political, religious, etc., uh, and is treated akin to other sexual transgressions, uh, adultery especially, and rarely, if ever, given the maximum punishment. Uh, there are a couple of executions in England and another couple in the Americas and but these are extremely rare and there are extenuating circumstances <clears throat> there are also examples we have a couple from Philadelphia in the 18th century of two women living as men in relationships with women and away and Mary Hamilton uh, again these are just the ones that we have actual records of because they appeared in the court filings for one reason or another. We have reason to believe, obviously, that this was a lot more common than one might think. A The poet, uh, especially, I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later, but uh, women dressing as men, living as men, in relationships with women, was was relatively common to the point that the poet Oliver Goldsmith wrote in 1762 that there were so many women in the British Army that they deserved their own separate battalion. So, homosexuality, homoerotic behavior, um, sodomy, buggery, were ignored or and tolerated, uh, especially among elites. I, I read one interesting account by a clergyman from the time period who associated um, sodomy with hatred of the poor. Uh, I, guess, I think it was perceived by many as a uh, elite affectation. Um, and again, when it was prosecuted, uh, it very rarely received the maximum sentence, and most of the time it was looked on as a uh, something uh, uh, generally not something to be too concerned about. Uh, it's worth mentioning here that uh, women in relationships with other women or engaging in sexual activities with other women was uh, up through the end of the 19th century in England and the Americas uh, essentially not prosecuted at all uh, if it was ever even noticed. Um, one of the sources I drew from breaks down sort of the, the perception of homosexuality into four, or same-sex intimacy. That's a better term than the one I'm using. Four recognized forms of same-sex intimacy. There's the libertine rake, uh, which is a bit like the aristocrats of James I's court. Um, there's the effeminate fop. Um, you know, the rake is virile and masculine, uh, which leads him to init initiate sexual relationships that demonstrate dominance over women and lesser men. Um, the fop is sexually suspect because uh, his effeminacy marks him as vulnerable to taking on female attributes. He might be a subordinate in sexual relations, which would lead him to succumb to so sodomitical activities. Um, the third form is heroic friendship, your Achilles and Patroclus. Uh, Patroclus? Pa Patrocles? Anyway. Um, deep emotional relationships between men of the emerging middle classes. Um, these were often a marker of one's class standing and character, and I've talked extensively, and I will give another talk on this sort of deep male friendship and bonding, especially among the English aristocracy in boarding schools and in imperial adventures and in the military. Uh, needless to say that this is a place of, of deep homoerotic um, tension, 
and expression, both, uh, well, more on that another time. Um, and then the sort of fourth type of same-sex intimacy is, is the sodomite, who is usually a member of the urban artisan or working classes, had no class privilege, um, and this was perceived as sort of a new form of deviancy because it discarded hierarchical, hierarchical power relations as the basic basis for this these homoerotic encounters and replaced it with consensual sex between men of similar status. This was, compared to all the other things that we mentioned, unacceptable. And it goes without saying that with everything that I'm talking about, there is a class and wealth dimension, which I am not going to go too deeply into, but I think it's worth bearing in mind that your that a person's legitimacy and the acceptability of their sexual identity in this time period and really in every time period has a lot to do with their class position and their power within that society. So, bear all of that in mind as we are talking about pirates. Um, sorry, this is James I and George uh, Villiers, his lover. Um, all right, pirates. So, <clears throat> I would love to talk about pirates forever. I am only going to talk about them uh, relatively briefly because there is so much to cover. Uh, this is a still from Black Sails, which is a great show. You should watch it. I enjoyed it a lot. The pirates that we are talking about today and that we talk about in general are a unique and specific instance of maritime piracy that flourished between 1715 and 1725-ish. This wave of piracy, this golden age of piracy, wherein just about every pirate you've ever heard of, Blackbeard, Jack Rackham, Bartholomew Roberts, um, all the all the greats um, had their heyday, uh, th this really emerged as uh, at the end of uh, Queen Anne's War, which ended around 1714, which involved, or which required the hiring of many, many thousands of uh, sailors, privateers, uh, and marines uh, for what was kind of uh, an extensive or a part of an extensive global war involving mostly England and France, but all the European powers. And as this war wound down, a lot of privateers especially, but marines and sailors of all types found themselves without a job. And so rather than just take to... begging or getting a worse job, they just decided to keep doing what they have been doing, which is robbing vessels on the sea, uh, except without uh, official approval of any crown. The pirates in question wrote nothing, or very little, and left little behind. They had a short they had short life expectancies, uh, late 20s at best, and the vast majority let, met their end in violence, either dying uh, in combat or being hanged for piracy, which was a capital crime and, unlike sodomy, was prosecuted aggressively as such. <coughs> um, it's worth mentioning that it was very easy to become a pirate. And by that, I mean that... The way that you become a pirate is basically somebody in a position of authority decides that you are a pirate. So if you were on a ship and your captain is abusive, incompetent, or otherwise undeserving, and things get so bad that you have to uh, replace him, that's a mutiny. And essentially that means that you're a pirate. If you're a privateer and your letter of mark isn't recognized or you take the wrong vessel or the war ends and you're caught and you don't have friends in the right legal position, you're a pirate. Uh, if, yeah, if political currents change, you're a pirate. If your ship gets captured by pirates and you uh, 
would rather join than be put back out to sea or worse killed, you're a pirate. So when we mention or when I talk about pirates, the many of them are quite deliberate and intentional about the for lack of a better word, career that they have chosen. But a lot of them are just sailors. In fact, most of them are, are simply sailors who ended up on a pirate vessel for one reason or another, seeking their fortune. Um, they are, in terms of class and race and character, very much like the sailors on any other vessel in the Caribbean at this time period. They are, however, in a lot of ways, more multicultural, more egalitarian, uh, more transgressive in a lot of ways. Uh, there were substantial numbers of um, of um, indigenous and African pirates, uh, either freed or uh, who chose to join along or join up with uh, pirate crews for a chance at freedom or a chance to make their own fortune outside of the uh, strict social hierarchies of the colonies. And they made their own way in a very interesting manner that involved substantially more equal terms between the crew and the captain than existed anywhere else in the world at the time, which is why pirates are such a source of fascination to so many people and especially to historians and to historians on the left like me. Um, more about that another time, but bear that in mind as we are going forward, who we're talking about, we're talking about pirates. So let's answer the question that you are all probably wondering, which is how homoerotic was a pirate ship after all? And the answer is that we don't know. We don't know for sure. But I, and it's not actually all that important. And ultimately, we can't say anything for sure. And I'm going to be careful about making assertions about the past. It, um, a couple of the scholars that I read discussed this, and there have been some attempts to. <clears throat> project backward um, surveys about homoerotic encounters in prisons to pirate ships, which is uh, problematic for a bunch of reasons. Uh, but there is no question that they were at least as likely to be involved in a same-sex relationship as anybody else in society at the time, if not more so, be given the uh, much more permissive and egalitarian atmosphere. And as I have, have just discussed, homoerotic same-sex relationships were, if not common, quite uh, normalized in English and colonial society at this time. It's also worth thinking about, and there's no evidence one way or another here, but around this time, for a variety of reasons, there were large crackdowns in Amsterdam and Paris and London on uh, homosexual, essentially, brothels or uh, what would be akin to modern-day bathhouses. They were sometimes called um, Molly houses after Molly's. Um, again, there is very little left behind by pirates for us to read. Very few journals that might indicate one way or another. So we really have to do a lot of extrapolation. Uh, but there is one thing that I think is telling. Not one thing, but there, there, there is one piece of evidence that's very interesting to me that I think is very telling about this. And that's a bit from Bartholomew Roberts's Pirate's Code. Bartholomew Roberts was a very successful and um, powerful pirate in the 17, early 1720s, and he's well known for a bunch of things, but mostly for his Pirate's Code, from which we learn a lot about the ethics and organization of a pirate vessel. 
And there are a number of articles in that Pirate's Code, but the most interesting one related to what we're talking about right now is Article 6, which states that no boy or women is to be allowed among them, that's the pirates, if any man were found seducing any of the latter sex and carried her to sea, disguised he was to suffer death. Again, I don't know that uh, Roberts's crew ever carried out this sentence, but it is, I'm, I'm sure the, the keen-eared among you knows that Roberts dictates that no boy or woman is to be allowed amongst them. And there is substantial evidence from other pirate or other um, merchant and naval vessels and from other captains of the time period that boys were often or young men were often taken to sea for the express purpose of or at least partially because they were intended to be or because the captain wanted them as a uh, for same sex intimacy. Uh, consensual or otherwise. This suggests to me that this was common enough to be worth commenting on. And again, I'm doing a lot of justification here because we don't have any proof, but my opinion as both a person and as a historian is that it's just like extremely obvious that same sex relationships happened on pirate vessels as they did everywhere else. Uh, and that they were probably, in my opinion, more common because these were homosocial, largely male space spaces, and because outside of the strictures of modern society, they were less likely to be bound by um, social norms that wanted them to uphold a patriarchal tradition, uh, produce offspring, etc., so on and so forth. Uh, that is not provable. That is just a uh, wild, unfounded assertion, uh, but I, I do think it's justified. There are two pirates that are, I would say, unambiguously queer, and that's, of course, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. <coughs> and they also deserve their entire own talk, and I will probably give one at some point, but... And Bonnie and Mary Reed were famously associates of Jack Rackham. They went to sea. They fought as pirates. They uh, dressed as men initially and then as women. But they continued to sort of blur the lines when it came to dressing, uh, often wearing men's clothing, but showing their breasts or going as men when it was uh, suited their needs, etc. Um, initially... And Bonnie was uh, an associate of Jack Rackham's. Um, and when Mary Reed came aboard the, the ship, she took her for a handsome young fellow and uh, discovered her sex that showed that she was a woman to Mary Reed. Uh, Reed took the opportunity to reveal her secret in turn. Uh, this supposed intimacy infuriated Jack, who was Bonnie's lover, and forced Reed to reveal his secret to him. Um, Reed, according to... Uh, the accounts intended to remain a man to the rest of the crew until she fell for a young fellow and suffered the discovery to be made of her sex by carelessly showing her breasts. Um, those of you who have watched Our Flag Means Death will be familiar with the character of Jim, who is uh, ambiguous and dresses as a man, sometimes presents as a woman, and... As I mentioned before, there were so many that uh, women going as men, living as men, dressing as men, especially to serve on in the military or on naval vessels was uh, common and well known. Um, <coughs> Mary Reed uh, fought in one of the Continental Wars and... According to the accounts, the only reason why she could not receive a commission was because she didn't have the money, not because she uh, did not uh, conduct herself well. In fact, she was well regarded for her bravery. It was that uh, the, the issue was that um, commissions were mostly bought and sold at this point in time. Um, so let's talk a little bit about 
I meant to mention this. So the what we saw here was from a subsequent printing of A General History of the Pirates, uh, which is uh, written by Captain Charles Johnson and is from where, where most of our information about pirates comes. Um, this second one is from the original printing of... Uh, it's a woodcut from the original printing of uh, A General History, and for reasons that I think are kind of obvious future printings were a lot saucier and uh, much more popular for this reason. All right, where was I? All right. Oh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about empire, about the colonies. So this is, again, something that I'll talk about or I've talked about in, in greater detail later. But... The empire, empires, colonies outside of settler colonial societies are very, very male-dominated um, homosocial spaces with very few women. Even in settler colonial societies, there are often fewer women than men. And this makes it a very interesting and a very ripe space for, um, for exploration of these kinds of homo, social, homoerotic relationships. Um, and there are a couple of really interesting examples of this that I think are very telling when we talk about pirates. And I think it's also very interesting that so many of them involve pirates because I think it tells us something about how this sort of um, social, economic transgression, um, living outside the law making your own way, uh, creating an independent, uh, deliberate community uh, was fertile ground for the imagination of people who lived within their more bounded communities. So the, the depiction of pirates in popular culture, I think, is very interesting because a lot of these depictions, even in contemporary writing, involve uh, same-sex or queer relationships. And, and one of the f most famous of these is Captain Singleton, which was written by Daniel Defoe. And this is not one of his better known or more popular novels. Uh, I'll be honest, I haven't read it. I tried. It's kind of boring. Um, but I did read some really excellent scholarship on it. And Captain Singleton is, like a lot of Defoe's books, about a guy who, in this case, doesn't much care for the life of being a merchant and takes the sea and becomes a pirate. And eventually in this book, in Captain Singleton, he makes friends with another pirate named Quaker William. And Quaker William and Captain Singleton become quite close, extremely close. Um, in such a way that historians like Hans Turley and, and others have read this relationship as sort of explicitly homoerotic, uh, and I think there is a substantial evidence for this. Singleton refers to Quaker William at one point as my guide, my pilot, my governor, my everything. He took care of me and all we had. Um, and then later, uh, William looked very affectionate on, affectionately on me. Nay, says he, we have embarked together so long and come together so far. I am resolved I'll never part with thee as long as I live. Go where thou wilt. Or stay with thou where thou wilt. At the end of Captain Singleton, they uh, adopt false identities and disguises and decide to live together indefinitely. Obviously, this is ambiguous in some ways, but a queer reading of this text is, uh, in my opinion, and that of, of many scholars, entirely justified and notable again because. I think that there is a relationship between the societally transgressive elements of being a pirate and what that allows in terms of what that allows in terms of um, the imaginations of those writing about it to say about uh, same sex or homoerotic relationships in one form or another. Another interesting example of this, again, from really just from a few years later is John Gay's The Beggar's Opera. 
and the sequel, Polly. These were satirical op operas that um, actually I'm not going to talk about. Like, it's all forms and specific types of um, musical operation and. Uh, it's all very tedious. Just know that it's there was singing. There wasn't always accompaniment, but sometimes there was. Anyway, one character of uh, A Beggar's Opera, Jenny Diver, a prostitute, falls for the pirate captain in Polly, who, and then develops feelings for another pirate, who in this case turns out to be Polly, dressed as a man. Uh, Polly, a character from the first, from The Beggar's Opera, uh, comes to the West Indies seeking her lost love and dresses as a man to protect herself. Um, ultimately, all of these characters end up in same-sex relationships, but there's a uh, there's a, a, a tantalization, there's a titillation about this sort of back and forth and um, <clears throat> attraction that is complicated by how a character is presenting themselves in one way or another. And it's clear from these writings and others that contemporary observers believe that there was something, as one of the historians I drew on for this talk, um, you know, something that was implicitly homoerotic about the, the pirate ship or, or being a pirate. Um, a, a 1765 version of the history of the pirates describes Mary, uh, sorry, uh, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed as lovers, uh, which is not something that is in the original text and not really supported by any of the available evidence. But I don't know that it's a stretch to assume or to interpret their relationship in that way. I would be careful about doing so, but I, I think that there is um, a way to go about that. So that brings us sort of back to our flag means death, to black sails, to uh, to pirates of the Caribbean, to a lesser extent. That was a pretty was a pretty straight series of movies, but that's okay. That's fine. There's there's a little bit here and there, but <clears throat> there's. I think a reason why the writers of this, uh, at this point, explicitly queer television show thought that the lives of Steve Bonnet and Blackbeard were fertile ground for depicting historical uh, same-sex intimacy, um, homoerotic relationships of one form or another. And I think that without really going too far. Oh, um, Goodnight Carolina asks, what are my thoughts on the book The Many Met at Hydra? Um, my thoughts are that it's one of my favorite books ever. I love it. It is, um, I think, a really, really important book when thinking about um, the... Uh, the 18th century in general, thinking about pirates, from thinking about the underclasses. Um, Redeker and Linebaugh do a really, really good job of talking about how all of the various uh, subcultures and uh, sailor slaves, uh, prostitutes, um, indigenous people, how they all sort of formed, again, a, a many-headed hydra. And especially the way that they show that the ruling classes and the powerful of the time period perceived themselves as Hercules, putting an end to this many-headed Hydra, this motley crew of um, non-conforming sort of working-class rabble. It's a really good book. I strongly, strongly recommend that if you're interested in uh, revolutionary history or early American history or Atlantic history that you read it. It's also a, a good book to read it's it's entertaining um got it i think it's a really good book good question good question good night carolina um and a lot of the background for this 
talk draws from the many headed Hydra. So anyway, um, I completely forgot what I was saying, but that's okay because I think I made my point generally. I'm just so tickled and so fascinated by this show because um, it fits so perfectly into a long tradition of writing about and depicting pirates and of um, using them as a vehicle to explore in the minds of more structured and settled people, uh, transgressive and, um, you know, otherwise boundary pushing relationships and behaviors. So, um, I just, I had to talk about this. I I'm going to stop with, you know, the beggars opera and Polly, but there are implicitly and explicitly more examples of this throughout history as pirates, grow in uh, stature in popular history and become such an important part of our shared narrative about this time period. And so I, um, you know, I, I think that it's just absolutely delightful and I want to believe that totally without any knowledge of um, the writing on um, gay relationships, homosexual relationships, uh, homoerotic relationships, about pirates, uh, again, which uh, many queer historians fixated on as a particularly interesting time period and social group to discuss, uh, that this show just sort of like emerged from the, you know, the new sphere. Um, because I, I do think that there is something about piracy about the pirate ship about pirates that um inspires our imaginations when it comes to um imagining different ways of being different ways of living thinking about um transgressing social norms in one way or another and so um i i think that's great i love it i can't get enough of this stuff um Thank you all for tuning in. I um, am going to hopefully talk more about pirates and about um, empire and about um, these homosocial, homoerotic relationships, especially those heroic friendships that I mentioned. I, I wrote kind of extensively about that, and there's a lot to be said about how uh, men in empire conduct themselves with other men and how they relate to other men that that ties very strongly to this but um if you've got thoughts or questions please do hit me with them and i have no idea when i'm gonna be back but hopefully soon because i've got a lot more to talk about so thank you all for tuning in uh, thank you all for listening while i kind of worked my way through this and uh, I hope you're all doing great. And uh, I'll be back, yeah, sometime soon with more Radical History.